Right. We're going to talk about building a Swordfish implementation from start. Uh, so I'm assuming all of you have storage arrays that you want to build a Swordfish implementation for. Let's start with that. <laughs> Not quite accurate, but still, you can get an idea of what's involved in actually building a Swordfish implementation. Um, this objective, again, is cut directly from the agenda, so you've had time to read this. You're obviously here, so you've probably read this and had an idea of what, is, uh, what are the learning objectives. So the SNEA Swordfish approach is that when you develop a Swordfish uh, mo uh, module, or when you develop a Swordfish proxy to your device, or when you put Swordfish directly on your device to act as a uh, management point, it's gonna provide a couple things. It's gonna uh, provide discovery, configuration, management, monitoring, that kind of thing. Um, but it covers a lot more than just blo blocks and the virtualization that it covers. It also covers things like power supplies, thermal, heat, everything. Um, the traditional storage domain coverage um, has been that storage and servers and fabrics should all be, the, the idea of Redfish and Swordfish and the expandability of it is that server, storage, and fabric should all be managed by the same protocol. That's one of the big problems that we had with SMIS was that it was not a single protocol that could actually manage a server, which also meant that it couldn't do software-defined storage, whereas Swordfish and Redfish could. So that's one of the big differences here. Um, again, Swordfish is an API that's an extension to the Redfish API. It's not a new API of its own. It uses all the mentality of the Redfish API, all the functions, all the features, all, all the goodness of Redfish, and expands it with Swordfish. And it's a lightweight, restful interface. Which again, is what differentiates it from SMIS. SMIS was not lightweight. SMIS generally meant that you had to have a full database to emulate your device off array. So, we're gonna look at the hierarchy of the Swordfish structure. I like to think of this as a file system, because if you think of it as a file system, you could explore that you can actually go down subdirectories and subdirectories and subdirectories, and there's objects you could open up, which in this case are files. You can actually look at all this stuff. And the, the key here is your OData ID is your directory names. That's gonna tell you either where you're at the in the model now, or if you're looking at a link or some other next step or next folder that you want to go to, it gives you the directory of that folder you want to go to. And it's always a full path, never a relative path. So it'll always start at service root. Um, here's an example of what a Swordfish implementation from the very basic level looks like. And again, if you look at the SNEA mockups, you can get examples of how to write SAN, NAS, and DAS, and NVMe, but you can see that what the root looks like and then you can go one level deeper. So in this case, I'm, I'm going from the service root, one level deeper to storage, and then one level deeper to chassis. So you can see I could just walk down these folders, and in each case, I'm using my OData ID, which I'm looking forward to here. OData ID tells me where in that, in that folder structure I am. That's almost like my present working directory. So it, it, it's really easy to walk through if you ment mentally think of it as a file system. Um, the, the first question is, what tools do you want to use to actually build your Swordfish implementation? And more importantly, how are you going to test it? Because the key is you want to be able to do some kind of an agile system here. You want to be able to run sprints. You want to be able to implement small amounts of the code at a time. Because if you try and do this as a monolith, you're going to get overwhelmed. So you do this piecemeal. You do it piece at a time. So in that case, the tools help you do that. Now, in purple are the things I'd expect you to write. Whoop. Either you're going to write a storage management app, or you're going to write a Swordfish provider, and this is your storage device. Or you have a client using your storage management app. But you can see that you, we've got a storage Redfish PowerShell toolkit, a Swordfish Redfish PowerShell toolkit. Where's my mouse? There it is. Which is right. Swordfish Redfish PowerShell toolkit here, written in PowerShell. There's a system uh, Redfish Pi uh, that's also out there. It's a CLI written in Python. There's also one written in the Golang, lo Golang library uh, for doing this. Um, and there's also the CTP. The CTP is technically a client because it actually connects to the Swordfish or Redfish implementation and actually verifies and validates that it works simply by pulling back the data that your implementation will give it and then checking it against the schema to make sure it actually matches up. The other three are simply just examples of how you can pull that data and import it to your host and use it in whatever way you want. 
These are the consumers. Now on the, on the provider side, there's a PowerShell provider example where, where I wrote a PowerShell provider um, that lets you point to an array using whatever the PowerShell toolkit is for the array, and you can simply interface, and this that works as an off array uh, proxy. And I've got examples of how to map that up, and I'm gonna show that to you later. There's also serverfishmockups.com. There's also a Redfish server out there uh, that you can actually download and actually uh, repurpose for your own uses to modify it and add Swordfish uh, functionality. And there's also a Swordfish emulator out there. So the, and the Swordfish emulator actually relies on the Redfish emulator. So there's a lot of different emulators out there that you can actually repurpose to try and figure out how to write your own. Um, and again, I'm gonna show you an example of a REST API to Swordfish map example. Um, and there's also a Redfish mockup creator that can help you to create a mockup. If you have a mockup that you wanna post, feel free to post that mockup and Rochelle will take a look at that mockup mock -up and possibly even post it on swordfishmockups.com if it's a good example of the protocol and it passes CTP. So we can get an idea of what these mockups look like. But more importantly, you can post something out there that you wanna actually explore, expose to the real, real world to make sure that they understand how you expect to deploy Redfish and Swordfish. So the PowerShell Toolkit's a little something I wrote uh, in conjunction with uh, my uh, partner at uh, Pure. Um, it's supported on Windows, Linux, Mac. Uh, and it makes a REST API wrapper that gives you a CLI to be able to call a uh, array or a server and be able to make simple queries without having to understand any of the REST language. You simply run, you import the module and then you do connect dash swordfish target, put the IP address in, and it gives you the, the Redfish root. Now once you've done that, you didn't have to authenticate. The Redfish root's always available. But once you've done that, now we have to go ahead and authenticate. To authenticate, you need to grab a, se a session token. So in that, I put a simple command, get redfish session token. Dash username, space username, dash uh, password, and the password name, and boom, all of a sudden it returns your token. Now the key is the toolkit actually makes this easy for you because it actually throws that token into a global variable that all the rest of the commands will use. So now, every time you make a, a future command, it will include the proper token so that you're an authorized user on that device. So you can start actually modifying things and changing things and looking into certain folders. So PowerShell is actually interesting because it, it doesn't return text. It looks like on this screen that I'm returning text to the screen. It's not text, that's an object. And in fact, I can dig into that object and extract everything without having to write my own parsers. That's the key. Because if I type my vols equal get swordfish volume, that will be a collection of volumes. And I can actually do my vols uh, uh, square brackets four and actually just bring up the fourth volume. I can pipe it to a filter and use one of my, my dot object, my sub object names like dot name and say volume five and automatically filter it and give me only back a volume that happens to match and have a property where it's, it's dot name equals five. You can also dig deeper and actually, uh, these, these objects are complex. They can actually be objects that are nested within objects with the, which are nested in objects and collections that are nested in objects and collections that are nested in hashtags. So you can get this all really detailed information. Notice also that you're probably used to using things in JSON form. Very few people think of the PowerShell form. They think of JSON form, that's easy. Type your command, pipe symbol, convert to JSON, built in it automatically puts back the exact JSON that that API call would have made. And in fact, you can take a JSON object, do a convert back to PowerShell object, back to JSON object, back to a PowerShell object, no problem. But you see, that's what a complex object looks like for volumes. Now realize that you may have 20 volumes on your system. It'll return a collection of 20 items. Each of the items is one of those. When you say I only want volume four, it'll only give you volume four, which happens to be that, but you can actually pipe that and give it back the JSON. Also, there's help, there's built-in help. You can do commands, get command, and do a help. But more importantly, you can actually say I wanna see the examples. I wanna show all, I wanna see what all my parameters are that I could possibly use with this command. Because there's a lot of parameters in, so you could say get volumes, or get system and only return one system ID if you happen to have six systems. Um, help looks like this with the included examples. Now, to do this, to make your own provider, because I've shown you the client side of it and how we've actually pulled the client information, which is important because it's hard to build a provider unless you can pull the client information very, very quickly and easily to validate it against the schema to make sure you're serving things up right. 
So if you want to be able to build, build a provider, I'm doing this in PowerShell, you can do this in Python, you can do this in JavaScript, doesn't matter the language. What's important is you have a REST method to get to your device, you have a raw device out there, and you have some method to get to it. REST calls, whatever. You also happen to have a either, in my case, I built a Swordfish uh, web server, but I could have just as easily done this with Flask on uh, Python. So it doesn't matter what I use as long as I know that I can actually insert the results there. So I'm gonna retrieve the object from my device and expand its JSON, and I'm gonna hold it up side by side to what the PowerShell object looks like. I've got my native device object, now I wanna show what it looks like with the PowerShell object, and then I'm gonna do a mapping operation. Now there's some things that are gonna be different. For instance, on my array, caching is either gonna be, the answer is gonna be on or off. But in the PowerShell module, it might be read ahead adaptive or off. So I might need to, to normalize the, the, the verbiage to make it match what it's expecting. So in that case, I can do that. This is what that mapping operation looks like. If I run a native get volume command on my array, the, the left blue side object is the object I have. On the right, you can see what a power, or what a, a um, uh, swordfish object happens to look like for the exact same thing. You can see the red lines because I can move and map certain things directly over. But you'll notice I've got to normalize the naming because block underscore size on my API happens to equate to block size on the swordfish API without a space or without an underscore. So I've got to change the name of the variable. In fact, that one is block, block underscore size versus block size bytes. But you can see I might have to change this case, I might have to change the name of the variables, but most of the time it's just a matter of mapping things one at a time. Once this mapping is done, that's the hardest work you gotta do. That's the actual hardest work, because the mapping operation to make sure you understand how your volumes work versus how the swordfish model or the redfish model works is the hardest part. Now some things, by the way, are gonna be static. For instance, in this case, I'm using a nimble array, nimble storage. Nimble storage only supports triple parity. So for RAID set, I'm not gonna return RAID 10, RAID 5, RAID, RAID 3. I'm not gonna return any of those. I'm always gonna return triple parity RAID because it's hard coded in, the, in, in my hardware. So I don't have to worry about detecting that from the array. I can fill that in statically. Um, and in fact, these are the steps if I were building a Swordfish implementation of my array. Step one is I'd create a static read-only model of what I want my objects to look like. I take the API that my, my array already supports or take all the features of my array that I can gather and I map that to the Swordfish model as, and, I, and I map over whatever I can. And again, Swordfish is very complex. You don't have to use everything. Most of it's optional. But there's some things you're gonna want. So I treat it as a simple folder structure. Redfish v1 storage my array volumes, volume, volume X. So you can see, the key here is if I do static mapping, I can do static mapping with a text editor. I could use VI if I wanted, it doesn't matter. But the point is you wanna implement this in text only so you can do a read-only mo model. You don't have to do read-write, just read-only model so you can validate to make sure it works. You could run this through the CPTP. It'll either tell you you've got misspellings, it'll tell you you've got case senses wrong, it'll tell you all those things. You do this manually with a text editor. Then once you've got that done and you know how the mapping's gonna work, then you start converting those static, those, uh, static values back into dynamic. Whenever you see a static value, you say to yourself, is that static value really supposed to be a static value or can I detect it? And that's where you start inserting your little bits of code. And you start inserting it over and start making all your, your, your dynamically va uh, defined values actually pull from the actual end device. And again, <coughs> excuse me, this is still a read-only device. But now you can start doing that mapping operation where you know that everything's coming in properly. And the key is you could run CTP over and over again once you do each of these steps to make sure that you're not breaking yourself, you're not introducing bre breaks. Because the key is you wanna be agile and you wanna be able to fail fast and be able to roll back. Once you do that, then you wanna do controlled access. You wanna be able to actually implement uh, session tokens. So at this point, you're gonna to have to add a few things. You're gonna to have to uh, uh, give the ability for yourself to uh, respond to a username and password and give back a token. And you're gonna to have to add a content type requirement. But once you do that, 
And now you can actually start doing um, operations where you can limit certain people and not limit other people. You can actually start doing things like that. You can actually ensure that the person who's connecting in is of a certain session and has certain rights. So you're gonna implement controlled access, step three. Step four is you're gonna start changing some of the values to read-write. So the model may show you 20 read values and 13 read-write values. Just because the model says something's read-write doesn't mean your implementation has to be that way. Your implementation could be read-write or read for everything and write only on a very small number of things. You don't have to be read-write on everything. So start implementing them one at a time and make things writable. Once you make one thing writable at a time, you can again run CTP, roll through your testing, make sure that each feature works. This gives you fast sprints, lets you fail fast, lets you roll things in, in uh, quickly. Um, and pay attention to return codes. If somebody gives you a variable that isn't valid or isn't allowed, make sure you throw the proper error code. Then, add resource deletion. Add the ability to make a, a, in the CRUD operations, add the delete capability, add the ability to, to remove an object where it makes sense to do so. Again, very easy to test, very easy to roll back and forward. Then add the ability to create resources. You've already made a lot of those resources read-write. Now have the ability to create a resource from scratch, and when you do this, create the resource, you're gonna have a certain number of variables or values that you're gonna have to set as, re as writable because they're required for the creation process. Now, this is an interesting one. A lot of people say, what happens if the user doesn't give me all the fields that are required? For instance, I say I wanna create a pool, and that pool is gonna be 10 drives, but I don't tell it which 10 drives. Or I say I wanna create a pool and don't tell it how many drives. You have to decide, as the creator of your array, what it's gonna do with that information. And what I mean by that is, your array can decide to have default values for things that are required parameters that somebody doesn't put in. You can decide if they don't put in a RAID level or an erasure coding level that you'll automatically default to a certain thing. Or you can decide that you'll fail the command and do nothing. So again, there's not, the Redfish and Swordfish do not tell you how you have to respond in that situation. That's gonna be up to your implementation. But again, success, uh, success uh, uh, return codes and failure to return codes are very helpful here. Seven, uh, option seven, or step seven, is gonna be implementing actions. So we've done create, we've done read, we've done update, we've done delete. Now we're gonna do actions. So once you've got actions, you, you've hit, the, you've hit the, all of them. So there's a bunch of actions that are defined. And again, there may be 20 actions defined. You may only need to support one or two or three of them. There's not a large number of actions. You can run the full CTP without supporting any actions whatsoever. The key is roll, roll fast. Implement something, anything that you can start with, and then simply keep rolling and rolling and rolling. Step eight, um, you have to decide whether you want to implement this as a proxy agent, or if you want to implement this in a container, or if you want to implement this on the array, where you put your code base. There's no reason that Redfish has to run a BMC or Swordfish. They could run on a third party machine. They could run in a container. It doesn't matter where it runs. All that matters is you get to decide that. And again, if you have an array out there that supports its own API, you can write your proxy agent to make calls to that API and then serve out Redfish. But it doesn't invalidate the original API. People can still make calls to the original API as well. So you now have two APIs that people can use and write against if you wanted it. Redfish is not an either or, it's an and. And then step nine is pass a CTP. Win fame, fortune, and respect of your, of your peers. Once you finally pass CTP, and again, I'm talking about using CTP as a development tool, but you can just as easily, once you've used CTP as a development tool, turn right around, run CTP for real, and actually post results and say, we are compatible, we are compliant. And Sneo will post those results for you. And again, it makes a great test pass. Modify your code, run CTP again. It's real easy to do. Um, and again, the idea is you can roll from step one to step eight 
and then reiterate right back to step one. You can go from step one to any step and re-roll back to step one and keep rolling as fast or as often as you want. There's no predefined rule that makes one right or, no, or another wrong. Here's an example of um, a volume, for instance. You can see that everything in brown is hard-coded. Everything with a dollar sign in front of it is a variable. And everything with a dot and then a, some yellow thing after the variable name is a sub-object. So you can see where I'm actually gathering information and posting it and pumping it into something that looks very much like a JSON object. Because PowerShell and JSON, I hate to tell you, they're the same thing. The only difference is, instead of using a, a semicolon, they use a comma. Instead of using an, a, um, um, the semicolon and the comma, and uh, instead of using round brackets, you use square brackets. That's it. Other than that, they work exactly the same. You can see it looks just like JSON. But again, you can see there's a lot of stuff that's hard-coded in there. Because to be a working implementation does not mean I have to dynamically assign every value. And most of those values are optional. So Swordfish. Um, and again, uh, I've written a mockup that talks to a nimble array as an example. But you could do this to a pure array. You could do this to um, a Dell array. You could do this to anybody's array out there. You could write your own Swordfish implementation that would do exactly that. And there's a sample one out there. You could do this in Python. It doesn't matter what language you use it either. Um, but I basically wrote a little piece of code that starts a listener out there that listens for swordfish commands and talks and pushes it to an array. So it's real easy. You can download that and just see how it's all done. All of it's open source, none of it's secret. Nothing I write is compiled. Everything is open and, and viewable on GitHub. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. There's specifications, user guides. Um, there's tools, practical guides. Um, we've got the mock-up sites. We have a number of white papers. There's a lot of videos out there. There's a lot of help out there to make this happen. If you want to put Swordfish out there and make some array Swordfish compatible, there's nothing stopping you. In fact, I'm surprised a customer hasn't done it yet, regardless of the vendor that, that, that supplies the hardware. It's just as easy for a customer to do it as it is for a vendor to do it. Um, and again, uh, submitting this to CTP as a certified solution is a very, very good way to go. Uh, again, uh, you're also welcome to uh, participate. There's a Golang client library called GoFish that can help with this as well. There's the toolkit. And again, you guys are going to get all these decks, and all the links are hot. There's an Ember.js client. Um, but we're always looking for more things to put into Swordfish that need to be there. You guys want to see what that uh, toolkit looks like? Let me change video source real quick, and I've got the toolkit right here to show you, if that's OK with you guys. Do we have a full-size HDMI converter? Yeah. A display port to HDMI? Can I borrow it real quick? That's a mini. Display port. Give me just a second here and I'll show you. Thank you. This is HDMI, this is DisplayPort. You are the man, no matter what all those people say. All right. Let me know when you see my screen. There we go. So 
So as an example, I can, let me bring the font size up here a little bit because it's kind of small. Whoa, that's too big. There we go. So I can go connect dash redfish target dash target 10 dot. So there's my root of, of a uh, redfish server. And then I'm going to go get redfish. And I'm tab completing because I can't spell worth a darn. Token. And I spelled that wrong. There we go. So now we got my session token. Now if I do a get redfish chassis, you can see I returned my chassis object, and that doesn't look like JSON, right? Well, to so there's my JSON code, and this is actually a live server. So you can see what this looks like here. And more important, if I cared about system, or if I cared about this drive collection, I could highlight this. Control C and get Redfish by URL. Oop. Need a single quote. Sorry if the color is not very readable. And there's my drive. So you can see it's very usable. Spell that wrong. Convert to JSON. Now, if I cared about, um, let's say, physical location, I could type this ver this in, put a parenthesis around it, dot. physical Is that a capital L? And you can see I can just do that and then pipe that convert to I cannot spell worth a darn And you can see I can just pull back that part of the model. And I could do the same thing and just keep diving into the, the object deeper. Notice I don't have to write a parser for any of this stuff. Dot part location. Service label. 
And you can see it returns that text back exactly. Now, that means I don't have to write a parser. I can actually feed that into another command if I felt like it, or into a variable. Um, I can also, if I'm getting something that returns a lot, like get um, redfish system, got to spell redfish right, system component, and notice also if I type subcomponent, and then, hit, and then I don't know which subcomponent to get, but I can walk through it, it'll tell me what all the valid subcomponents are. So I don't have to know any of this stuff. That's the beauty of this, is I can just gather things without knowing what they are. Oop. I don't know why that's not working. But you can gra grab individual items you, could, you don't have to parse anything. You can walk through the tree however you want. If you do a get, eh, get command dash module, um, Snea Swordfish, you can see there's a lot of commands out there. Chassis reset, drive secure erase, manager reset, system reset. So there's a lot of things out there. You'll notice also that this, some of these commands end with redfish. Other commands have swordfish in the name. Everything that's a redfish command in this toolkit is also a swordfish command. But not everything that's a swordfish command is a redfish command because things like fabric don't exist in the redfish model, they only exist in the swordfish model. Or storage pool. So there's a swordfish version of that command but not a redfish version. And they're the exact same command. They work identically. And my monitor just went out. Here we go. Um, so let's, uh, and, and there's other things, like for instance, if I do new redfish certificate, God, I got a spell right. And I, it says alternative name. So you can see that, that it prompts me by hitting tab. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sharing the right screen. It prompts me for all the fields I don't know. City, here, so I, I can, it, it, it can be used to help clue a user into what this, the, the values are. Now I should also note that if, who here uses VS Code? Anybody? Uh, VS Code, it's a uh, text editor, does Python, does all kinds of languages. This is if you open it in VS Code. This is the entire module. You'll notice that there's a bunch of actions I can do Every commandlet is actually a function. Every commandlet's got the built-in help, which is actually written in Markdown and open source. So you can actually open the source code and read how the help files work. You can also read how the parameters work. And you can read how all of this happens. These commandlets are utterly simple. Everything's open source, everything's readable, everything is designed to be used from a CLI by somebody who does not understand the protocol or doesn't need to. That's the key. And that actually is my entire session. That's what I was gonna show you guys and some of the tools I've, I've written to try and help make adoption of Swordfish a better, easier thing to do. Um, but the idea was that I want you guys to be able to go away with the ability to write your own Swordfish implementation for your own storage devices. Um, or someone else's storage device, for that matter. Because there's nothing saying that, that the vendor themselves has to be the one to write it. Any questions? Yes? Uh, that's a pretty cool tool. And what's the backhand for that? I mean, how does the information pull from, from the file system? <laughs> it's embarrassing. Invoke REST method. 
which is no different than curl. There is no dependencies. It's native PowerShell code. It just uses curl. Oh, I did forget one thing. That one thing is, if you do an operation like get redfish chassis, and you do a verbose option, it'll tell you, it flew by there really fast, it'll show you in yellow how it walks through the tree to find what it's looking for. So you can see I iterate from the root down to V1, down to chassis, down to chassis one, and then I return that back. So you can see how I'm actually walking through everything. But there are no dependencies for this code base. This, this PowerShell toolkit works on PowerShell and Linux, PowerShell on Mac, PowerShell on PC. Um, it has no dependencies, there's no .NET or anything like that. It just needs invoke rest, which is no different than curl. And in fact, you could do all of this with curl. How does what? How does the uh, function, I mean, the shell, the PowerShell, knows how many chassis are there? Oh, it, 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 it looks at chassis, and then once it finds chassis, chassis contains a collection. But where does the chassis? Where, where does the chassis? I'll show you. So in this case, I could do a get redfish by URL. Uh, get. redfish by URL, redfish slash v1. So that's the first call I make. Is it lowercase r? Yeah. So here, I, go to, I first go to the root. Once I'm in root, I look for chassis. So you see there's chassis, and it shows you what the chassis is, which is basically, Oh, with a capital C. Chassis, there. Notice that there's chassis.mem, or chassis.members. So then, I do this, dot members, if I spell it right, and there's my members, and then I pipe that to get redfish by URL, and boom, there's my chassis. Because if you notice that previous command, that one, there's the URL to a chassis with an ID of one. Be because the chassis root, which is that, points to all the members of the chassis. Um, so I go to root, I find chassis. Go to chassis, find the collection. Go to the collection, iterate through them one at a time. Yeah, I think I'm not making myself clear. I mean, if there's chassis, we know there's you know, kind of collection card on the PCIe, that's a number, right? But how does the chassis know that there's multiple plugin card on there that interpret each plugin card and the chassis? I mean, each resource will have a hardware to handle that, right? Yep. But how does the function connect between the hardware, the physical hardware, and the uh, resource, the logical resource over there? That's up, up to the implementer of the hardware. For instance, on a Dell server, a Dell may show up their server to have five chassis in it. And they call this drive bay one chassis, you know, this four pack of drives, one chassis, this four pack of drives, a different chassis, the PCI drive cage, or the PCI cage, another chassis, and the power supply cage, a third, another chassis. Who and they, they do, in fact. Who did they um, don't know. But the point is, the Dell will show five chassis on a single server. And some will be for power supplies, some will be for PCI cards. The HP will only show one chassis because it's the drive chassis in this case. I'm just pulling it right from the model. Wherever that device is telling me, that's what I give you. I can't tell you how many chassis they have. I could just give them to you. Yeah, so this is mock-up. Kind of the, this is the reference model, right? But where does the reference model, the, 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 uh... 
the model is a little loose. The model can actually allow you to make as many chassis inside of that box as you want. You could call your processor core your chassis too. You could call your memory dim sockets and say this group of memory dims are on one chassis, when in actuality, most people wouldn't consider it a chassis. It's up to the people who implement the actual Redfish on that individual server what they happen to call a chassis. There is no standard. There's nothing that says a chassis must be this. Well, I'm just telling you what the truth is. And the truth is what the server tells me. If the server lies to me, I lie to you. <laughs> okay, so this is not the server. This is a client. This PowerShell toolkit here is a client that just simply pulls. You could also make it into a server if you wanted, but then you have to write all that logic yourself. I'm showing you two different tools. Yep. This is the client implementation. This is using the client like a CLI. It, any other questions? Because we're running pretty close on time here. Hopefully this was helpful, you guys. Hopefully you saw cool tools and you can go out there and write Swordfish. Now the SNEA labs do have a Swordfish implementation in them right now. We're looking for more. All right, thank you very much.